Our reading today is from Matthew, one of the first Gospels and one of the first verses in the New Testament, describing the background to the birth of Jesus. Basically, the reason it is there is to wipe away any doubt about Jesus not being the Christ. Mary is pregnant, and guess who isn't the father? (laughs) The man Mary is engaged to, Joseph. According to the laws of the Old Testament, Mary should be killed publicly for committing adultery, but Joseph decides to let her go quietly, which in those times would have led to Mary being cast out by her family to starve, but alive nonetheless. But an angel comes in a dream to Joseph and reveals that the child about to be born is Emmanuel, God with us. Our verse today is from Matthew 1, uh, verses 18 through 25. If you enjoy pictures with your verse, refer to the Spark Story Bible, Emmanuel, Wise Men, and the Escape to Egypt, on pages 218 to 225. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgins shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. O God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be worthy in your presence. Amen. As I've grown up, there has been One question that has kept me up at night. One question that baffles me to no end. Why do all grown-ups find babies to be so cute? (laughs) If you ever get the chance to sit and watch a toddler crawl into a room full of adults, you should observe their reactions. They absolutely go nuts. They could be talking about the most serious time-pressing matter in the world, but these grown men and women will stop whatever they are doing to form a small circle around the child and make ridiculous, nonsensical noises at it. I've noticed this isn't a common trait in teenagers, though. They can look at a small child walking around and just kind of stare at it, unnerved, like it's going to fall over randomly and they'll all be blamed for it. And other children don't look kindly at babies. They are simply a smaller presence at best and a distraction for the adults at worst. This leads me to conclude that sometime in our early 20s, something is triggered in our minds, some switch is flipped that makes us think that these messy, drooling, puking, overly dependent little people are the most adorable things in sight. I regret to inform all the younger people in the room that, though you may think I am hip, as you all say, I have succumbed to this exact thing. It was a year ago, during the holiday season. It didn't snow a whole lot, but enough that there were piles of snow along the sidewalks and the streets of southern Chicago. I was minding my own business, walking to the grocery store when I saw it. A family of five was walking on the other side of the sidewalk on the opposite 
street from me. A mother and father with three kids. The oldest was somewhere in their tweens, probably 12. The middle child was around eight or nine, but the youngest was two at the very oldest. The child was bundled up in a big snowsuit, so only its eyes and a little tuft of blonde hair could be viewed beneath all the hats, scarves, and jackets that the parents had managed to stuff this poor kid into. I was just glancing at them when the youngest had clearly spotted something interesting in one of the snow piles. The child stopped, hesitated for a second, then tried to reach down for whatever it was. But the child was bearing more fluffy winter clothes than its poor little body could manage, and they fell face first into the snowdrift with an audible poof. <laughs> the child clearly wasn't hurt. In fact, it wriggled around in the snow a little before the parents helped them up. But the damage was done. Not to the kid, to me. I had stopped on the spot on the other side of the street from this site and let out the most frightening noise I had ever heard myself make. You're so cute. Oh my God, I find us, you know. I didn't intend to. I didn't know I could make those noises. It just happened like someone else was making them for me. I knew then that it was too late for me. I'd moved completely out of my youth and into my adult years. I've heard some speculation on why adults dote over babies and toddlers where younger people don't. Adults find babies adorable because it's ingrained in us by evolution. We feel the desire to take care of babies because it's good for our community and ultimately our species. Adoration of something leads to attachment, and attachment leads to safety. Because let's face it, babies are terrible at taking care of themselves. As a young adult without children, I can say honestly that babies are basically useless in the here and now. They can't feed themselves, they can't clean themselves, and they can't chase down prey for sustenance. Even puppies and kittens, which are equally adorable, if not more, can do these necessary things, but human babies are completely at the mercy of whoever is taking care of them. This is what is so fascinating about Jesus' birth. We hear our scripture today being read, and we kind of nod and say, well, of course, God becomes a baby. It's in the Bible. When in reality, this idea should be making us freak out, or at least having us scratch our heads. We've lost the originality and shock of the events of Advent. Emmanuel, God with us, is just a given after 2,000 years. The problem is in making Advent common, we've lost some of its stunning importance. This is the God of the Old Testament we're talking about. This is the God who melts mountains, the God who turns Sodom and Gomorrah into piles of rubble and people into pillars of salt. The God who called the entire universe and the laws of physics we barely understand into being with four simple words, let there be light. This God becomes the most helpless thing we can think of. We don't imagine Jesus needing diapers, but he did. We can hardly imagine Jesus being burped or spitting up, but it happened. And can you imagine that baby Jesus cried out in the night because he was scared? These are things we don't think about because it isn't befitting of God. Yet these are realities of being human, of being a baby. And our beliefs claim that God became this, a helpless child, for you. 
There was another possibility for God, wasn't there? In Poland, some Christians approach Advent completely different than we do. There isn't any Advent festivals. There's no bright lights or pretty decorations. Instead, as you walk through a village, you may see business closing early and people rushing home. The houses don't have any decorations up and there's no lights hanging from the roofs. In fact, they try to leave most of the lights off. Instead of going to parties or shopping at malls, these Christians sit at home and pray and spend time with their families. If there's any singing at all, it isn't the jolly songs we like to sing, like Deck the Halls, but serious carols with haunting melodies that echo throughout the night. Why? Because instead of expecting baby Jesus, they expect Christ, the judge, to come at Christmas. They pray for forgiveness all throughout the Christmas season, waiting for God's judgment and wrath. It's only on Christmas morning that there's celebration. Behold, Christ didn't come as a judge or a king on high, looking down at his subjects with appraising eyes, but a gentle babe wrapped in whatever his parents could find. The thankfulness in the air is palpable. These Christians embody the feeling of awe about Jesus' birth that we have lost. We only have a hint of this connection. Some churches still put up purple during Advent instead of blue, the same color of Lent, to remind us that Jesus' birth cannot be seen without Christ's future death. But that's it. It becomes so easy to forget the wonder and utter ridiculousness of God coming to earth in one of the smallest, defenseless, but precious forms we know. This is what has fascinated scholars and preachers for thousands of years. God is everything we humans aren't, immortal, holy, good, and all-powerful. The being that literally created concepts like eternity becomes one of us, being born to a poor, scared couple in the equivalent of a farm town in the middle of nowhere. And why? For you, for all of you, for all of us. This is what the season is truly about. Not the lights or the shopping or even the family time we get together. But because God was willing to become something so outside of what God should be. All to show that God loves and cares for you and for me. It seems impossible that God would become one of us, but it's a reflection of the incomprehensible love God has for all of us. That is what makes Jesus the precious child, the one we all gather around and adore. Amen.